Hello, and welcome to the Family Histories podcast, the show for and about those of us who are potty for probate records, infatuated with inquests, and wooed by war diaries. My name is Andrew Martin, and I've been researching my entire family tree for more than 25 years. In this episode, I'll be finding out how my guest got hooked on family history and deciphering DNA, we'll be meeting their convict laundress ancestor, and we'll try to help unravel a mystery in early Victorian Gloucestershire. So, put down those prison records, grab a cuppa, and let's meet today's guest. My guest today is a family history addict who has been more like an undercover sleuth, secretly searching for records about her family history. Not because she's embarrassed about this wonderful pastime, but because it went against a family warning. What a rebel. More recently, she has started tracing her husband's family tree and has turned to blogging about her research. Therefore, with the evidence presented before us, there can be only one suspect as my guest today. It's Jane Huff. Hello, Jane. Welcome to the show. Hello, Andrew. Nice to meet you. And you too. Um, so I've dangled a bit of a, a tantalising carrot, I guess, in that introduction about uh, a family warning. So I can maybe guess why uh, you are interested in researching a family tree. But can you tell me kind of where this began and how you got hooked? Yes, certainly. So um, I first became interested in family history because my dad used to do some research um, and I, I remember his written trees and um, some of the names of my ancestors gradually became familiar. Um, I have vague memories as a child. I would have been, I guess, eight or nine. And um, we visited a churchyard in Hertfordshire to find the graves of some of my ancestors. And my brother, who would have been perhaps six or seven at the time, absolutely freaked out when he was told that a family member was laying six feet below where he was standing. <laughs> Um, obviously he was very young and perhaps a natural reaction. And then when I was a bit older, um, my dad took me to London a couple of times to look at, um, birth, marriage and death indexes and, um, census records. And, uh, this was in the 1980s. So I quickly learned the art of using a microfilm reader and. Oh, those, those things are, I think they have it in for me, um, particularly the microfiche readers, um, and that little kind of snapping little uh jaws where you put the put the sheet of microfiche mm. in to uh and it always would always clap down on my hands and bite um so i remember those i wouldn't say fondly <laughs> no and um so, so that was that was that's was quite an adventure i mean i i lived in a, a small village in cambridgeshire so any trip up to london was quite unusual and um um quite an adventure but um my natural curiosity ratcheted up ratcheted up several notches um, when my dad told me that granddad, so his father, told him not to go digging in the past. So I think that that's that's one of the things which sort of really got me interested. You know, what is it that granddad doesn't want us to know and, and discover? And um, I did though hear other stories about um, you know from my grandparents about um, ancestors and I guess like so many people now who are interested in uh, genealogy I really wish that I'd written down the things that they they, they told at the time um, and that's you know that, that's a great regret of mine um, so that that was my sort of teenage years but then university came along and a job in London and a big a sort of busy life in um, social life in my 20s and 30s. And um, I didn't really give it much thought for many years. Um, but then I got back into researching it more seriously in 2010. Um, I'd recently become a mum. And um, I think perhaps, you know, as you become a parent, you start to think about a family in a different way. Um, and I think also it probably coincided with when Who Do You Think You Are first launched on um, TV. Yeah. And um, it, it sort of it, it dawned on me that perhaps I, I could do a bit more. And of course, by this time, there, was, there were records available on the Internet and, you know, um, there were, was family tree software available. So that's it's 2010 when I really dived in properly and I, I've, I've been sort of quite serious about it, albeit as a hobby, um, ever since. There's certainly a lot of um, familiar um, points in there that I can 
can um, relate to as well there. Um, you said you started researching in in the 80s and have kind of progressed from there. What what kind of tools did you use to kind of get you started? Did you have any kind of, was it all paper-based or did you have some kind of software or? Um, back in the 80s, it was all strictly pencil and paper. Um, <laughs> Dad drew the trees. He, um, you know, obviously he had memories of you know, a generation of ancestors yeah. that um, had possibly mainly passed away by the time I was interested. So um, there was some, there was, a, there was a body of information that was sort of quite well established within the family. It was much more on my dad's side than my mum's side at that point. Um, and given that my dad was, you know, the main sort of, you know, instigator of it, um, we focused much more on that side. Um, so my dad's father's family all came from Huddersfield in Yorkshire and um, his mother's family came from um, Hertfordshire and Bedfordshire, um, which was obviously much nearer to where we lived. So that was you know, hence, hence the um, visits to churchyards um, to sort of try and find the um, gravestones of some ancestors on that side. Um, so you've just said that uh, you... Has kind of have traced both sides of your family maybe more so on on one side um and you've got them back a reasonable way is that the kind of the furthest that you've kind of traced them back where have you got them back to um i'd probably say these days that i've done just as much on my mum's side as my dad's actually so it started off very much focusing on my dad's but um i've i've done a lot of on my mum's side um, obviously it varies according to which branch you go back. Um, and on one or two branches, I've had some lucky breaks that has got me back sort of right to sort of six times great grandparents, nice. which is sort of, you know, early 1800s and into the late 1700s even. Um, and you know, like, like many people, you know, there are other bits where you have a, a serious brick wall much more recently. So for example, um, when I mentioned that my grandfather said that um, my dad shouldn't go, shouldn't go digging, I've, I've now discovered that the reason for that was that because his father, my great grandfather, was illegitimate, oh, okay. and I imagine that um, you know, given sort of historical views of illegitimacy, my my grandfather was probably quite ashamed of that. Um, so that's something that I'm now pursuing through having done a DNA test. And just before Christmas, my dad did a DNA test as well. And there are some hopeful signs there. Um, we have a group of mystery matches, um, all in the USA. Um, and I've put together a tree of something like nearly 300 people of how these people, how these matches are related to each other and taking their family back. And the intriguing thing is that their family, um, while it's been in the USA for several generations, their first emigrant came from Huddersfield in Yorkshire, which of course is where my family came from. And the plot thickens. (laughs) The plot thickens. I can't, I won't be able to tell you any more about that for this podcast, but perhaps, you know, if we were to sort of, you know, um, you know, do a follow meet up, up again yeah. next year. There's, there's possibility of a follow up. I think um, I am narrowing things down, and obviously the mixture of the DNA evidence and the traditional paper-based research and this sort of intriguing link back to Huddersfield um, is. I'm getting there, um, but. Um, I'm taking it slowly because it. I think it's very tempting just to jump to conclusions, and I want to be, I want to be sure, and I, I want to be able to say either that there is enough evidence to say what the link is, or to say only that it's likely, and we won't probably ever get there completely. I'm absolutely gobsmacked at your dedication to untangling that DNA <laughs> <laughs> as you know what as wonderful as it would be to to unravel that and solve it I'm just completely blown away mm. as to how you would actually mm. um, unpick all of these people who potentially 
have no connection, well, a very distant connection to you. Obviously, their DNA matches, mm. so they have some kind of connection, but a very distant connection to you, or they might have a very strong connection to you. Um, mm. that, that is a lot of dedication for those um, mm. shared matches, I think. A couple of them I, I've exchanged quite a few emails with and are, are very interested in family history. Um, one of them is a little younger than me. He lives in Texas, but um, he's absolutely devoted to family history. And um, my sort of working assumption is that he's a half third cousin to me. So this is quite distant, um, but um, we shall have to see how that one how it pans oh, out. Wow. I think you've perhaps just bought yourself a ticket for, for another <laughs> series. <laughs> um, so just before we started recording, I had to ask you how to pronounce your surname. Um, for the listener's benefit, it's spelt H-O-U-G-H, uh, Hotel Oscar Umbrella Golf Hotel. Um, to me... That could be how, as in a village near me called Houghton. Um, it could be Huff, as in tough, with a T at the beginning instead. Or it could be Hoff, as in cough, with a C at the beginning. Um, so yes, Engli English is a beautiful and wonderful mixed up language. Um, has that name been hard to research because I know you said that you have been tracing your your husband's um, family tree um, has it just been really difficult uh, has it been quite inconsistently spelt um, the spelling has been pretty consistent so just to clear things up the um, pronunciation is um, as it would be with a t on the front so it's tough or rough um, everybody finds it confusing and um Having been married now for 20 odd years, I'm much more used to people getting it wrong and I'm much more aware of people needing to needing to know how it's pronounced properly. Um, my husband's family all hail from Cheshire in the area around um, Nantwich and Northwich. And in fact, his Huff ancestors, many of them worked in the salt mines in um, that part of Cheshire. And um, I've managed to research some of them who were salt miners. And I guess it's something that we quite often come across is having to learn a about an industry or an occupation that to us is, you know, we know almost nothing about. Um, and very quickly, um, you don't just want to research the people, but you want to research their lives and what they did for a living and what their towns and villages were like. And, you know, the, the environment in which they lived. Um, one particular branch of his family um, actually were boatmen and they worked on the Weaver Navigation, which went from that part of Cheshire out to the out to the Mersey. And so, so they, they were transporting the salt um, out from where it was actually produced to the Mersey, where it could be reloaded onto bigger ships and transported um, much more widely um, and I've got a census record where um, they were recorded as being on their boat at Runcorn um, in the docks so that that was quite nice that they were actually aboard yeah. their boat actually on census night. Oh, that's that's really nice um, and do you find that there are any other surnames with in your tree somewhere that has a lot of name variants or um i have on, on my mum's side so my grandmother's maiden name was scoble which she spelt s-c-o-b-l-e okay um but lots of the older records spell it s-c-o-b-e-l-l -L. um okay. so perhaps scobell yep. you might think of producing it uh, pronouncing it um, but it's, it's one of those things that, you know, I guess you need to understand that when many people didn't know how to read or write, um, spellings did end up varying. Um, and those who were able to write perhaps wrote the name as they heard it, which might be different to how someone else had recorded it in a, in another situation. So I think, you know, 
sometimes I've been sort of I've lost the track, um, but in other cases, you know, I've learned ah yes, that is a that is a variant of the same name, um, and they probably are my um, are, are my ancestors. But it's it's a bit hit and miss, and you learn by your mistakes in that sort of thing. Um, I've certainly got better at it, and um, but you know, with all these things, we you know we we can always improve our skills. We're now into the part of the show called Relatively Speaking, and here's where my guest picks one of their most interesting ancestors or relatives that have a good, bad, or just plain ugly life story, and they share it with us. So, Jane. Who are you going to introduce us to? I'm going to start to tell you about um, my five times great grandmother. Um, she was born as Mary Stone. Um, she, it starts in the village of Stoughton in Wiltshire, and um, the story ends up halfway around the world in Australia. And in this case, it's very much a story of crime and punishment. Um, the reason I wanted to choose this story is it, it just shows how much is possible with family history research, um, the range of records that have been preserved, um, newer records that have been developed. And I think more than anything, um, the benefits of reaching out to others and asking for help and finding that you know, the family history community is a very friendly place. And there are so many people out there who are willing to share their knowledge and their experience. Um, and that, that, that's that been a real a real pleasure in, in doing this piece of research. In terms of where I started out, um, I, this is actually my maternal, 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 maternal line all the way back. Um, so it's, it's, uh, it was quite interesting to do, do that. Um, that's very much a, a coincidence. It wasn't a, it wasn't a research sort of target. Um, I just, a happy coincidence. A happy coincidence yes. Um, and um, one of the first sources I found um, was the online parish clerk's website for Wiltshire, um, which is a website where lots of records have been transcribed by volunteers. Um, and I, I really hit gold because the village of Stoughton um, was the, the actual online parish clerk um, as well as doing the volunteering, she actually did the work as part of her PhD thesis. Um, so she did, you know, she captured absolutely every single record that that, that that was in existence and uploaded them to this website. And in fact, for her own research, she um, set up a new database of all the families in this village and um, how they were related to each other. So um, that was incredibly useful. Wow. Um, so, so that gave me a, a, a brilliant checkpoint. I didn't want to just copy everything that related to my family, but um, it was an enormous help. And um, it was a sort of a checkpoint. You know, I think it's this. What does uh, Kathy Day think? And what did she do on her website? Um, so I guess that's where Mary starts. And she was most likely born in about 1759 in Stoughton. Um, and she married someone called George Brasher um, in 1781. Um, I've got the marriage records from the Wiltshire Parish Registers. Um, she would have been heavily pregnant when she married because she married on the 4th of June and her first daughter, her first daughter um, was baptised on the 8th of July. So that's not okay, that's, pretty that's close. not a very long gap. I think probably less than a little less than five weeks. So um, that was a, a slow walk down the aisle. I suspect so. Yes. Um, and they had um, a further eight children. And I was quite fascinated by the names. So the first child was Letitia. Um, we then had Martha, Fanetta, Clarissa. Um, there were twins, Stephen and John. And then there was Sophia, William and James. And in terms of the family history research I'd done at that point, um, they were quite unusual names. And um, initially, I thought perhaps I found some people who perhaps of a higher social class than Possibly most of my ancestors who were either agricultural labourers or um, worked in woollen mills or coal miners and this sort of thing. 
Um, and I was quite intrigued, but um, I found an article in a family history museum, uh, sorry, a family history magazine. Um, and um, I haven't kept it, unfortunately, but um, I found out that these names and many others derived from Italian were often associated with Roman Catholic families. Um, and then I looked back to the Wiltshire website and found that there was a long history of Catholicism in Stoughton. Um, so that possibly explained it. Um, but then I quickly found that they weren't wealthy and they probably weren't upstanding. And um, I found records in the bastardy bonds of some of the daughter's children um, where the putative fathers had been summoned in front of the magistrates to make a contribution to the child's maintenance. Um, and then I even found that one of them had been convicted of being a lewd woman and received a prison sentence of six months. Yeah. So clearly this um, perhaps wasn't the family I possibly thought they might be. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> um, and then... I guess, as many of us do, we have a, a tree on um, ancestry, and obviously that generates hints. And I'm always quite careful with them. But from time to time, I, th I, I, I look at the hints and see what they're pointing me to. And um, on this occasion, one caught my eye, and it referred to a – it was a legal record, and it related to a court case. And it wasn't one member of the Brasher family, but it was four. So it was George, his wife Mary, the daughter Martha – and also the son-in-law, which was the husband of Letitia. Um, and they were all charged with larceny, which um, I quickly found was theft of personal property. Um, and the father, the sister and the son-in-law were all discharged. Um, but then in the case of Mary, the mother, um, it was a very different story. And then in the record, in the column where it said sentence, I saw the words transportation, seven years. Um, Ooh, okay. So that quickly um, quickly um, sort of changed things. And, um, you know, I, I realised I got a convict in the family. <laughs> um, but obviously all I knew was that she'd, um, she'd been found guilty of theft. And that, no, that, that wasn't enough for me. I, needed, I really needed to, to know more. Detail. Um, I was at a, fam a family history show and um, there was a stand there by the Wiltshire Family History Society. And, um, you know, so often, you know, I, I, I grew up in Cambridgeshire. I live in Kent. Um, I was actually born in Wiltshire, but um, I only lived there for the first few years of my life. And I got chatting to people and they said, oh, if you drop us an email when we're back at the um, at the local record office, we'll, we'll do a bit of digging for you. And a couple of weeks later, I got an email back. And um, they'd found the records which were in the local archives, um, not on ancestry, um, but they found that she was charged um, on suspicion of stealing a qu quantity of diaper and dowless linen cloth, um, some damask napkins, um, and that these items were the property of someone called Sir Richard Colt Hoare, Baronet. Um, so that immediately... Well, there's your, there's your connection. Yes, indeed. <laughs> um, so I now know what she had stolen, which was various articles of linen. But what was far more important was who she'd stolen them from, because Sir Richard Colt Hall, Baronet, was the owner of Stourhead House, which was a big, sort of, not, perhaps not quite a stately home, but a very large manor house. And um, Stourhead these days is most famous for its beautiful gardens that were designed by Capability Brown. And there are sort of um, beautiful um, buildings in the gardens. And, you know, it's now owned by the National Trust. So essentially, she'd, um, she'd stolen from the Lord of the Manor, which is probably not a very wise thing to have done. And I couldn't help but think that Perhaps her sentence was harsh in order to deter the other, the other villagers there. And then a bit after that, I, I'd, I'd been posting a few things on different family history forums. And I got an email from a lady um, who was a volunteer at Stourhead House. And she had done some work um, looking at the archives actually at the house and she'd found even more information about what my five times great-grandmother had done. 
And um, it wasn't so much that she was st- stealing items of linen, but she was cutting off pieces of larger linen and taking those. And in some cases, she even rehemmed the large items to cover up the fact that she cut pieces off. Um, so then her her house was um, was searched um, and the items were found in, in her possession. And um, I can't help but thinking that she she probably did it out of desperation. She her occupation she was she worked in the laundry at the big house. So I suspect that she was sort of you know, if you think about a big house where, you know, tablecloths might have fitted tables that seated, I know, twenty or thirty people, she was perhaps just cutting a couple of feet off the end and possibly selling it on um, or making it into other garments for her family um, and trying, you know, obviously re-hemming them to try and hide what she'd done. But she was found out. Um, and initially she was um, she was incarcerated in the jail in Salisbury. Um, I think the thing to bear in mind that, you know, while some of her children were teenagers or grown up the the youngest two were aged just nine and five so you know for a mother to be separated from her husband and her children and for those young children to suddenly have their mother taken from them is is just very difficult to comprehend um and one of i mentioned earlier about um sort of collaboration um when i was writing up this research, um, I realised that the jail was in Salisbury was referred to as Fisherton Jail. Um, and during my research, I found that in Salisbury, while the jail is long gone, parts of it still remain and have been made into the a, a clock tower that was built in Victorian times. And frustratingly, I was actually in Salisbury last year, but um, it was only after my visit that I found about found out oh, about yeah. Fishton Jail. Um, but there's someone I know on, on Twitter and she, she kindly went and t- took some photos for me. So I've now got a picture of the place where my five times great grandmother was initially held um, before she was before she was transported. Um, oh, that was really nice of them. Yes, that was very kind. And um, after a few months, she was taken on board a ship called Sydney Cove and... They set sail from Cornwall, initially from Portsmouth and then from Cornwall. Um, There were four male convicts on board and 113. And the journey took more than five months. So it would have been obviously around the um, Cape of Good Hope, around the base of South Africa. And they arrived in Port Jackson in New South Wales, Australia, in June 1807. Um, So at this point... I was researching things I had never looked at before in my life. I didn't know anything about convicts. I didn't know anything about Australian records. Um, and again, once more, I was helped um, through people on online discussion forums for family history. And in particular, by a lovely lady called Sylvia, who was very knowledgeable about um, about Australian records and especially about researching convicts. Um, and the good thing, I guess, about criminals is that there are lots of records about them just because they're criminals. And the good thing about convicts in Australia is that um, because it was very much a new colony, the government and the officials had to make lots of records so that the colony could be run effectively. So they conducted what were referred to as population musters, where everyone had to go to a certain place on a particular day to be counted and so forth. So similar to a sentence, a census, um, but um, actually having to go and report to a particular place. Um, But those records, many of them are preserved in New South Wales archives. So, um, you know, I've been able to trace various information. And I guess one of the best things about those convict records is that they all refer back to the ship that the convict originally arrived in Australia on. So if you've got 
people with if if you've got problems with names being spelled slightly differently and you're not sure whether it's your one or someone else um they all tie back to the ship they arrived on so i had some spe- some records which said mary bradshaw and mary bratcher as well as well as mary brasher but because they all tied back to arriving on the ship sydney cove in 1807 i had that sort of level of confidence that it was the same person um so that was really helpful um so she got her freedom after her seven years um Initially, I thought, oh, presumably that means she goes back home again. But um, I quickly found in my research that convicts very, very rarely returned back to England. So she stayed in Australia. And I think she made something of a success of her life, actually, because um, I found records um, that she gave. She was granted 50 acres of land from the governor um, in return for some land that she gave up um, to allow for building the streets in the town of Windsor, which these days is, I think, probably a a suburb of Sydney. But um, she clearly owned some land and exchanged it with with the authorities so that um, streets could be finished. And that seems quite a big jump to me from, Mm -hmm. you know, the underwasher woman at Stourhead to someone who is being granted land by the governor. Um, And then... Things changed again because um, in 1830, she married once more um, and um, she married another ex-convict. Um, he was called Thomas Porter and um, I think she was probably, well, she said she was 60, but I think she was probably nearer 70 actually at the time. Um And in some of the records, there's a note saying the parties have cohabited for four or five years. So um, clearly it it wasn't a it wasn't a quick fling. Um, But um, I think possibly they knew each other for rather longer than that, because right back in 1814, um, the muster record for Thomas shows that he was assigned to a Mrs. Bradshaw. So given the differences okay. in spelling, I think it, it's, it's likely that they might have known each other for many years before they actually married. Um, and um, I found out, I did a bit of research about Windsor, and it turns out that um, the church there was actually is actually the oldest ch- um, Anglican church in Australia, and it was actually built by the first, on the orders of you know, one of the first governors of Australia. And um, again, finally, I did find her, well, someone else found on my behalf, um, located her burial record. And she was buried in the churchyard of the same place that she was married. Um, and this was, again, from another source I, I hadn't heard of. It's something called the Biographical Database of Australia. Um, and while there were various possibilities for different death records, um, once again, the crucial check here um, that was helpful in so much of the research, um, it notes the ship of arrival. So the death record of Mary Porter in 1834 um, notes that she arrived on the ship Sydney Cove in 1807. So, um, you know, with the help of lots of different people, it's it's really been a fascinating story. Um, I don't know anyone else here in England who's got a a convict ancestor. I know several people in Australia who do, and it's a bit like being related to royalty. I think if you're an Australian with convict ancestry, but um, it's it's been a fascinating journey to discover all of that. Um, I have been to the village of Stoughton and um, seen the church where she would have married and her children were baptised. Um, I hope to go to Starhead House. In fact, the lady who's the volunteer has offered to. Um, try and get me a sort of below stairs little visit if I'm oh, able to go. Peak. Indeed, yes. So that would be absolutely <laughs> fascinating if I could okay. um, go inside the house and see the places where she actually worked. That would be really amazing. And you need to leave your scissors at home, okay? Indeed, yes. Well, I'm not much of a needlewoman, so I'm happy <laughs> to sort of say that no, I won't have scissors or a needle and thread. Um, I, I would love to see where she worked, and I would also love to see the gardens because I'm a keen gardener, but I'm certainly not a needlewoman. 
Yeah, there are definitely more legitimate ways to get to Australia. Indeed, yes. Um, I think possibly planning a trip to uh, to um, to Windsor in uh, New South Wales is perhaps a little bit ambitious at, at, at the present time. But um, you know, I've I've seen pictures and there's, there's a good website for the town, so I, I have a sense of what the place was like back in those um, back in the early 1800s. Well, thank you, Jane, for sharing Mary's life story. It was really interesting. But now I think it's time for... The Brick Wall. When the trail of clues run dry in our research, we call this our brick wall, an obstacle in our path to finding our relatives. In this part of the show, my guests will tell us about their current brick wall with the hope that you, you, or maybe even you over there, might just have an idea or, or the next clue that could help them bash it down. Pencils at the ready, listener. Jane, how can we help? Right. Well, back in the summer last year, um, I did manage a brief trip to the Forest of Dean in Gloucestershire, which is where many of my ancestors um, on my mum's side came from. Um, And I went to visit St John's Church in the small town of Cinderford to see if I could find any gravestones of my ancestors, because I knew that many of them had been buried there. Um, I first went there back in 2014, but had very little time. I had my husband and young son with me, and that's not very conducive to sort of poking around a graveyard trying to find the gravestones of um, ancestors, even if you say there's a bar of chocolate for the first person that finds someone with this particular name. So on this occasion, I went there on my own and left my husband and son back at our holiday cottage. Um, So I went back to the gravestone of my two times great grandparents, um, George and Sarah Bowdler. Um, I'd found it before, so it seemed only right to just pay my respects there quickly. Um, And I was looking at the gravestone again, and then I looked at the graves just behind it. And it turns out that the grave, possibly no more than two metres behind, was actually the gravestone of my three times great-grandparents, who were called Thomas and Harriet Edwards. Um, Harriet was the, um, um, so these were the parents of Sarah Jane. Um, Now, Thomas Edwards married Harriet Bosley um, in the village of Abenhall in Gloucestershire in 1838. Um, Thomas's occupation is given as a millwright, and his father was John Edwards, who was also a millwright, Um, I wasn't immediately sure of what the term meant, but um, I looked it up in a dictionary of old occupations. And it's a special type of carpenter who made the machinery that went into windmills and watermills. So axles, cogs um, and of course wheels. Um, And while I've got plenty of information about Thomas's life and his family in the Forest of Dean, um, I don't know very much about his origins. Um, On the census records for 1851, 61 and 71, um, he's shown as being having, having been born in Wales. And the spellings are interesting um, in terms of what they say, um, but I'm pretty sure they all relate to Llanetli, um in Carmarthenshire. Um, they are quite strange spellings, but if you actually read them phonetically, they do actually sound quite like that. And um, as with so many old records, um, you have to remember that people didn't necessarily know how to spell things that weren't in their immediate area. Absolutely. Um, And I was looking at the baptism records of all of Thomas and Harriet's children, um, trying to look for extra clues. And I found that in one case, um, their daughter, Mary, was baptised on the same day as um, someone called Elizabeth Edwards um, with the parents who were John and Elizabeth. So I wondered if Thomas might have a brother. So I researched him a bit more. And I found him on the 1861 census in the Forest of Dean. And it said that he was also from Llanetli. Um So now I'm looking for a Thomas and a John Edwards, who are two sons of John Edwards from Llanetli. Um This is where I'm stuck because the surname Edwards is a very, very common surname in Wales. Um, I've not really done any other, almost all of my ancestors come from England. Um, and I've really not looked 
any records beyond English records. Um, I've done a DNA test with Ancestry and I've got my public tree on their website. And um, earlier this year, both my tree and the through lines feature um, on Ancestry um, suggested a possible mother for Thomas. So I knew that the father was John Edwards, a millwright, um, but these were suggesting a mother called Jane Lodwick. Um, and there was even a long and quite detailed pedigree chart going back many more generations. Um, but the problem with this was that the husband of Jane Lodwick was a Reverend John Edwards. Um, now, I'm pretty sure that John Edwards Millwright and John Ed Reverend John Edwards are two completely separate people. Um, and in fact, what's even more curious is that um, in part of my preparation for recording this podcast, I went back to, to this um, just to refresh my memory of it. And um, all those hints have disappeared. And I've no longer got a through lines connection to, to this particular family. So I've gone back and found the um, tree that I originally looked at. It's always helpful when you keep notes of these things, that you know, things you look at, um, especially other people's trees. Because, of course, like all of us, we're always changing our trees and updating them. Yeah. Um, so the tree still has a Thomas Edwards on it with roughly the same dates of birth and death as my Thomas Edwards. Um, but on that tree, he's no longer married to Harriet Bosley. And they've removed all the census records which link him to the um, Forest of Dean. So I'm therefore stuck with um, trying to find a Thomas Edwards, possibly with a brother John, and definitely with a father called John, in the area around Llanethley in Wales. Um, it's one of those sort of needle in a haystack, too difficult piles. Um, I'd like to put more effort into it, but I'm not really very sure where to start. Um, I have just bought a book on how to research your Welsh ancestors, and I'm looking at that. Um, I have some knowledge of the sort of Welsh traditions of patronymic naming and how that worked. Um, but obviously, if any listeners to this um, podcast have any ideas of how I might make a start to possibly knock a few bricks down, um, I'd be very grateful to hear from them. And on that note, what's the best way to contact you if they have some ideas? Um, I produce a blog. I, I try to write at least one article a month. Um, I work full time and I find it, I would love to be able to spend more time doing research and more time writing. Um, so my website is called www all those before dot org dot uk so you, you can contact me through that website and in fact you'll actually find a blog post about this particular ancestor it's called my too difficult pile and um, because that's exactly what it is you know, a brick wall um, is one term but I like to say okay that's too difficult I'm putting it on the pile over there for another day um, so in that article, there are all the census references that I've looked at and the details of the various parish registers I've looked at. So at least if anyone does want to take up the challenge, you'll see what I've looked at so far and what I've found. Um, and you can obviously contact me through the website. I think it, well, hopefully this will be moving from your too difficult pile um, with the help of one of our listeners, um, just so that we're clear, um, can we just get that earliest date for for Thomas Edwards and and the parish where you think he should be? Yes. So so he lived um, most of his time. He was in the parish of, well, in fact, I say parish. Um, the Forest of Dinian is a bit yeah. interesting in that it was only parished, became divided into parishes. Um, in the second half of the 19th century. So the church is, so the church where the records exist is called St John's Church in the town of Cinderford. Um, but some of the census records um, refer to him living um, Forest of Dean and it says extra parochial. So the place where he actually lived was not actually in a formally designated parish. 
and um, some of those census records refer to him living at Furnace. And I'm fairly sure that that was a reference to the ironworks which existed there. So that, that, that's, that's the village where, that's the church where most of the um, baptisms took place. And then his marriage was at a village called Abbon Hall, um, because St John's Church Cinderford was was only built in Victorian times. So having been married in 1838, yeah. um, Cinderford no wouldn't would barely have existed at that okay. point. So let's imagine you had I don't know, say a once in a lifetime trip in a time machine. Then you would go back to what Abbon Hall for the marriage. I think yes. I think I'd probably want to be sort of look, either in the church or just outside the church to sort of um, to grab probably his father actually, rather than Thomas, you no, know, the, the groom and his bride Harriet. But I'd want to take his father aside, John, um, say, you no, know, so assuming he was at the wedding, you know, just because someone describes their father. Um, on, on the marriage register, I guess you shouldn't assume that they were actually there. Um, he, he wasn't the witness. He was named as the yeah. father. So perhaps I, perhaps I would need to talk to Thomas himself. Um, I think I'd want to really pin him down and say, you said Llanethly, but where exactly? Was that in the town of Llanethly itself? Was it a village nearby? Um, that's what I'd really want to find out. And so I guess the two things, the geography, the place exactly, and the name of his mother I think that those would be my two bits of information that would be the most important to actually get hold of. Well, do you know what? I think I can probably help you with this, but uh, you'll need to follow me into the garage. OK, well, lead away. Well, I promised you a time machine and here you are. What? Really? Yes. Ratio, and... where should we go first? Uh, wait a moment. This isn't some kind of long-running fictional television series about hopping all around time and space and having fun. This is one trip for you, there and back through time. I have to stay here and control all of this. Oh, right. I'll sit here then and wait for you to make it work. Perfect. Right. Uh, then all Gloucestershire. And it was the what, what of May? Um, the date was the 20th of May, 1838. Excellent. Catch. You'll need to keep that with you at all times. Press the big green button when you're ready to come home. Brilliant. Right, here we go. Right, Jane Huff. Thank you, goodbye and good luck. Ah, uh, wonder how far Reykjavik is from Gloucestershire. Oops. The Family Histories podcast was presented and produced by me, Andrew Martin, with additional sound production by Elliot Lees. My guest was the wonderful Jane Huff, and if you've enjoyed this episode, then please click subscribe to get the next one, or consider leaving a review. Thank you. Approximately no family historians were harmed in the making of this podcast.